Good morning. Good morning. There we go. And listen, gentlemen, just a couple of a quick announcements before we begin our time. And oh, Aubrey, will you bring me my Bible, please? I need to have my Bible up here. This afternoon at 4 p.m., we have our first Vacation Bible School volunteer, thank you, volunteer and leader meeting. So anybody interested in being a part of Vacation Bible School this afternoon at 4 p.m., we will meet in the Media Center. Uh, if you cannot make the meeting and you do want to serve at Vacation Bible School, please let me, let Dorothy, let Tam, I don't think Tracy's here today either, just let one of us know that you do want to be a part of that and if there's a particular area that you want to serve in. But please, 4 o'clock this afternoon, our first VBS volunteer leader meeting. Number two, and this is also in your bulletin, um, we're working on another trip to Boston, another mission trip. And so I'm going to have an information meeting this Wednesday night at 645, and then I'll do another information meeting next Sunday, the 28th at 5 p.m. So if you're interested, just want to learn about Boston, there's no obligation, but I'll have more details this Wednesday night or next Sunday afternoon. So if you're interested, please come and, and learn more about the plan to go to Boston later this year. Last but not least, our ladies are headed to a women's retreat this Friday. Please be in prayer for our ladies. I'm, I'm expecting God to work and move. I'm expecting to hear some stories. I'm expecting to hear some testimonies of what the Lord did that weekend. So y'all be, please be in prayer for our sisters as they travel this weekend. Hear the word of God, Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread. For God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his captive people. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. I don't know about you, but this passage always puts the desire in my heart to seek the, God, to seek the Lord to run after him and to be reminded that there's nothing good in me. There's nothing good in any of us. That's why we need Jesus, the only perfect one who can allow us to be reconciled to God. All praise and glory to him. Is God dead? No. Sometimes who's dead? We are. Hymn number 469, let's stand and sing. Revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb who was slain. Have borne all our sins and hath cleansed every strain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us 
us again, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love, may each soul be we take time for our corporate prayer time, I'm going to ask my prayer team, y'all come on down to the altar for me. Y'all come on down, my prayer, my prayer warriors, y'all come on down. If y'all didn't know that each week we have a group of our church members who during our worship time, they pray and they cry out to God on behalf of what's going on here. Y'all go to the altar. I want to ask you, this is our time that we give to the Lord, a burden on your heart. If you all bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment, and as we take this time, I have my prayer team down here. If you've got a burden on your heart, you need to come to this altar. I want to encourage you to do so. The invitation's open now. Maybe you've had a hard week. Maybe you've got a challenge before you. Maybe you've got a praise. Maybe there's a, something you just need to have somebody pray alongside you this morning. I know yesterday I got word that Pam and Tony Boatwright welcomed a brand new grandchild in their family little Evelyn, but Evelyn's heart is still being developed and is in NICU right now. So we're going to remember that family, Harold and Caroline, this precious little gift. Maybe there's some challenge in your family. Maybe there's something, some opportunity. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you're seeking God on a specific matter. I want to encourage you and invite you to come to this altar this moment. Maybe you're part of the personnel committee and you're burdened to pray for our church bodies, we have a meeting tonight. Maybe you want to pray for Vacation Bible School coming up. We gather our first meeting this afternoon. Maybe you're burdened to pray for our city, pray for our state, to pray for our nation. Maybe to pray for our women getting ready to leave on this special retreat this past, this coming up Friday. Father, you see your people laid before you this morning. And as our hearts are gathered, we, we want to remember the Boatwright family and this precious gift, Evelyn, you've blessed Harold and Caroline with. Oh, Father, you continue to show your love and grace as you give that, that little girl a special healing, a special touch. Give that family a special favor from you. Father, this afternoon as we have gathered our first meeting for Vacation Bible School. Would you just please raise up the workers, draw people unto yourself, prepare us, Lord, so that we might be prepared to minister and reach out and connect children and families in this community with you. Father, I want to pray for all of our ladies going on this women's retreat departing on Friday. We pray not only for safe travel and that everybody arrives on time, but I want to pray that you will meet them in a special way this weekend. As our sister Tammy DeBose gives a special message and shares, Father, I pray that, Lord, something supernatural, something miraculous will happen and our ladies will come back with stories to tell, to speak of your faithfulness, to share about how you met them in an awesome, miraculous way. And I pray that a supernatural fire would burn in our church body. Father, there's others in the pew this morning who have other burdens on their hearts. They might not feel led to come out. They might be a little afraid to do so. Would you meet them where they are? Father, continue, God, to lead this time of this transitional period as our church, showing us your goodness, your faithfulness, your grace. And Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, I pray that we'll have our eyes fixed on Jesus the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. For we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 I don't know if you remember or not, but two Sundays back, the Gideon was speaking, and at the end of the service, I said, everybody needs to tell somebody about Jesus the next week and bring him to church. 
Well, the last Sunday was that Sunday, and we were on the way home, and I was talking with Debbie, and uh, she, I said, you brought somebody to church with you? She said, yeah, didn't you tell me to? And I thought, wow, the wives do listen to the husbands sometimes. <laughs> if there's a spiritual conversation, most of the time they don't. But just think if, if I didn't bring anybody to church, and I'm the one that started it. But my wife, she said, I brought somebody to church. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but that, that young lady was down at the altar last Sunday when a uh, pastor asked for prayer. So, Debbie, is it a hard thing to do to bring somebody to church? It's not a hard thing to do. Maybe we all need to practice and learn that. Hymn number four, To God Be the Glory. Let's stand as we sing. Mm -hmm. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who The people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God. The offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon received. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done, great things he has taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be. the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Morning, church. A little different. God laid on me that I get up here and pray, and y'all don't want to hear this crackling voice, so let's pray as a group of Christians together this morning the way the Lord had taught us as we sing, uh, pray the Lord's Prayer. And all Christians say, Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass in us. And it's not a temptation, but the Lord is from me, our endless kingdom, and power and glory. Amen. Amen, church.
As I was coming to church this morning, I uh, this song's been on my heart for a couple of days. And usually when there's a song on my heart for a couple of days, there's a purpose in it. He usually, that's usually the way he works. And uh, What if I were to tell you this morning that there's more to God than what you've experienced? What if I were to submit to you this morning that you have as much of the presence of God in your life as you desire? You can have all of God you want. And right now, you have all of God that you want. It's just something to think about this morning. I just know for me, like, I've been serving God for 25 years. And there have been times that I've been so close to him, I felt like I could feel his breath. And there's been times that I've been so far away from him that I couldn't hear him when he called. But through all of that, I've realized that regardless as to whether God's hand is on me or whether, whether my hand is in the Lord's hand, God's hand is still on me. And there's, there's a lot that I was talking with uh, some of our church members yesterday um, about the storms that we face in our lives and the things that we go through. And a lot of times we go through the darkest times in our life and feel like God's a million miles away. And there may be some of you here this morning that feel that way, that God's just a million miles away. It's been a long time since you've knelt in the presence of God and felt his spirit. But one thing that I've learned is that the Bible says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so... You need to understand where God's secret place is. A lot of people think that, you know, that it's just speaking metaphorically about some deep spiritual connection that you have whenever you go into your closet and pray for 10 hours. God's secret place, according to scripture, is in the darkness. There's a verse in Psalms that says that he hath made darkness his secret place. And there are several instances where it talked about Moses, that he went away from the people and he drew himself into the thick darkness where God was. So if God has his secret place in the darkness. If darkness and light are the same to him, that means that in the darkest times in your life, in the deepest darkness that you face in your life, that that's where God dwells. You may feel like he's a million miles away, but I promise you, he's right there next to you. And I haven't always done right by God, but he's always been faithful to me. And I thank him for that. And this is just a song of worship about his presence. And I pray it blesses you this morning. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this hole. sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I've just sang another song 
So take me back to where we start. I opened up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. So take me back to where we start. Oh, brother, you just led us to the throne. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, what a perfect way to begin our time in God's Word. If you've got your Bibles, if you would open up to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, we're going to begin in this morning. Nehemiah chapter 8, as you're turning and finding Nehemiah chapter 8. Real quick, I forgot to mention to y'all that in your bulletins there, um, You'll notice something about the National Day of Prayer and these special um, 31 Days of Intercession for America. We've got these out. We're asking for just a $5 donation. Debbie Phipps is going to be at a table in the back by the office afterwards or at, outside here, and you can talk to her more about these. But we have some available if you just be prepared to pray through the month of May for our country. Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. A woman by the name of Gina Kelly... She was in sixth grade in 1979, and one of her duties as a sixth grader was to be a crossing guard. I remember in fifth grade, I was a patrol, have you all had those here in South Carolina, but be a, be a patrol officer, well, she was a crossing patrol officer for her little school in sixth grade. And on one February morning in 1979, a pickup truck hit her. 
she flew 150 feet in the air, landed on a snow embankment. She ended up with six broken ribs, a punctured lung. Her right side of her face was paralyzed. She lost hearing. She had a severe skull fracture. The doctors told her parents that night that she was not expected to live through the night in the hospital. And they told the doctor that even if she did live, that she would never walk again. She'd never talk. She would be, never be able to think or reason in her mind. Fast forward 14 years later, and Gina was over in Peru serving as a missionary. She served in the physical therapist ministry, and she was at a clinic one day. And a couple came in. The wife had been hit by a bus. Now, Gina still carried those scars. She was unable to raise her right eyebrow. She still had the loss of hearing. It was very clear from her scars on her face what she'd been through. And the husband in Spanish very bluntly asked her, what happened to you? Why does your face look that way? Now, she had never had anybody be so blunt and straightforward. And so she shared the story, and she began to share with this couple about Jesus as her Savior and what he had done for her. And that couple right then and there repented of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ, and they became followers of Jesus Christ. Gina today is a, a wife, a mother of two grown children. She loves to do Taekwondo, as my son does. And she's also faithful to teach Sunday school to four-year-olds and five-year-olds in her church body. But when Gina gives her, her testimony, when people ask what her message is, she said her message is very, very clear. It's very, very simple. Her message is, God is faithful. God is faithful. I know in this room, many of you can tell stories of God's faithfulness. And I bet many of you that right now are thinking in your own lives of maybe a specific time period or a specific event in your life when you have seen God's faithfulness in a mighty way. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the wall is built. God begins his work on the people. And we saw last week that God begins rebuilding the people through his word. And while God's people are in his word, in Nehemiah chapter 8, they discover the importance of celebrating God's faithfulness. And it's that passage we're going to look at this morning in Nehemiah 8, verses 13 to 18. Nehemiah 8, 13 to 18. As you're turning and finding there, if you're already there already. We've been walking through the book of Nehemiah on Sunday mornings, and if this is your first time with us or even watching for the first time online, God has you to hear this message today about his faithfulness. And again, last week we saw in Nehemiah 8 that the people were gathered to hear the word of God that was shared by the priest Ezra, the scribe. And they heard about the joy of the Lord being their strength. And now a small group of those teachers are still in the word. And not only do they discover that the joy of the Lord is their strength, but God's faithfulness is as well. And so I want you to hear the word of God, Nehemiah 8. Let's look at verses 13 to 18. I'm in the New American Standard 95. You can... Listen along or look in your own translation. But here's the word of God, Nehemiah 8. Then on the second day, the heads of father's households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts 
and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was great rejoicing. He read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word. We thank you for your word. And I pray this morning, Lord, that I would be faithful to preach your word, to share your word according to what your word says, not what Brian Sherwood says. And Father, may we as your people receive your word and be faithful doers of your word. May we rely on the power of your word in this special time in worship. For we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. All of God's people said. Amen. So previously in chapter 8, verses 1 to 12, we looked at last week. The people are listening to the Word of God for five to six hours. Now, I'll be honest, y'all, for me as a preacher, I'd get bored. I'd be looking at my watch. I'd be looking around if I had to listen to a sermon for five to six hours, especially one of my own sermons. But here these people, after they hear this, they're not tired. They still have this appetite to learn more from the Scriptures. And the very beginning of verse 13, there's a small group of those who teach God's word, the, the Levites and the priests and the heads of the households, and they were eager to learn more. I want to say how grateful and thankful I am for our Sunday school teachers. Many of you all not, may not recognize or realize the effort that our Sunday school teachers put in. And some of our Sunday school teachers, I know you all sometimes have Sunday mornings where the class is full. And some of y'all might have a Sunday where people are gone and it's very, very little, if any. And yet you're still faithful to prepare God's word. Man, I'm so grateful and thankful for you. Well, these were like the Sunday school teachers. These were those who taught God's word. They were gathered around. And they learn there's a special festival that they've neglected to celebrate. The Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But it was basically a festival that celebrated the faithfulness of God. We talked about the joy of the Lord being your strength last week. There is strength in remembering God's faithfulness. There is strength in remembering God's faithfulness. One preacher said, obligation and appreciation are certainly strong motives for serving the Lord. But celebration is even stronger. Obligation and appreciation are certainly st strong motives for serving the Lord. But celebration is even stronger. In the passage this morning, we're going to see the importance of celebrating God's faithfulness. And maybe in your life this morning, maybe you're heading into an uncertain future. God's word is for you and me about remembering his faithfulness, celebrating his faithfulness to move forward into the future with him. What are the three truths we would need to learn from God's word about celebrating his faithfulness? Number one, I want you to notice God expects us to celebrate his faithfulness. God expects his people to celebrate his faithfulness. We need to take time to celebrate God's faithfulness. Now verse 13, go into God's word, not my word. The second day, again, you have the, these teachers of the law, the heads of the households, the priests, the Levites, they're gathered. Ezra is sharing as they can learn more insight into the word of God. And verse 14, they found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. This was in reference to the festival of booths or tabernacles. And these instructions were found in Leviticus 23. Listen to Leviticus 23 verse 42. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. 
that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The festival of booths or tabernacles was one of three great feasts. There was the feast of Passover, the feast of Pentecost, and the feast of booths or tabernacles. Booths were, were tents made out of branches or leaves. And it celebrated the 40 years that God's people were in the wilderness, were in the desert. It celebrated God's faithfulness. The idea was to point back to the days when Israel experienced God's faithfulness in the wilderness. That's what the whole purpose of, of this. And the festival pointed to Israel's birth as a nation. See, God didn't want them to forget what it was like when times were hard. Now, I want, want, want you to notice there were two important reasons for the feast. I have these on PowerPoint here. First important reason for the feast was remembering God's presence. They had to remember God was with them in those 40 years in the wilderness. That God would still be with them now and even in the future. They had to remember God's presence. But a second important reason for the feast was remembering God's provision. God had provided for his people. And so they, they read this in the word, and then verse 15 says, so they, they proclaim a proclamation. They, go, they say, hey, we need to go and make these booths. We need to collect these leaves. We need to, to, to gather these myrtle branches, palm branches, and just as is written God's word, so they do that. And verse 16 says, the people went out, they brought them, they made booths for themselves, each on his roof. Now, most of the houses at that time, they had these flat roofs. So most of these booths, most of these tabernacles were built on top of these roofs. And this symbolized those 40 years in the desert, God's people didn't have their own houses. They had to make, they had lived these, these tents, these booths, if you will, for 40 years. And they were remembering God's faithfulness, his presence, and his provision. And notice it says there in verse 16, they did this in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. Last week, if you were here, you may recall that the people were gathered in front of the water gate. And it was, in, it was intentional. God's people were drinking of the word. And during the festival of booths, each day they would take a pitcher of water and they'd pour out a pitcher each day. On the eighth day, there would be no pouring out. It would be a day to take in and drink of God's presence and his goodness. You may recall in John chapter 7, Jesus goes down to Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths, festival of, of, of Tabernacles. And it's right there in front of the water gate. Jesus says this, John 7, verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You see, Jesus as the living water is the ultimate satisfier. And one of the biggest lies, one of the, the biggest deceits of the enemy is to lure us into seeking satisfaction in everything else but Jesus. You see, the Feast of Booths point us to God's faithfulness. And while we're not commanded anymore to celebrate the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, we are to celebrate the living water. The stone that was hit, gushing of that living water. And Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, verse 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It's important that you and I take time to celebrate God's faithfulness. Those times in our lives, we need to let our children and our grandchildren know of those times when God has been faithful again and again and again. They remind us 
that no matter what we're dealing with right now, if we're concerned about if God's faithfulness in the future, all we've got to do is just go back and remember his faithfulness in the past, and we celebrate his faithfulness. All right, but number two, I want you to also notice we are to gather to celebrate his faithfulness. We are to gather to celebrate his faithfulness. Now, you and I can celebrate his faithfulness in our own personal worship time, but I want you to notice in the passage, God's people were together. Verse 17, look at this. Verse 17, it says, the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. Folks, it's important that we gather to celebrate God's faithfulness. You know, one of the, the special times we take from time to time is communion, the Lord's Supper. And right now, my best laid plans is for us to celebrate communion that first Sunday in May. That will be my birthday, Cinco de Brayo, so it will be an extra special day for us, all right? But it's important. When I take the Lord's Supper now, and I look around and I just see the church together, I can't help but smile and break out that we're together feasting in this special supper. In the same way, they were gathered together to celebrate the Feast of Booths of Tabernacles. Many of us here, I have them in my family. You've got family, friends. I'm a Christian. I don't need a church. It's an excuse we hear. But the people are the church, and there's an expectation to gather with God's people. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews was written during a time when the early church was under severe persecution. You could go to jail. You could even be executed if you were caught gathering as a church. Yet the author of Hebrews writes this, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, verse 23. He who promised is faithful. There's that word again, right? Faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Folks, there are so many benefits and blessings of gathering as the church. And I, this past week I compiled some. I want you to see these. It's important. you got someone in your life, maybe you got someone in your family who wants to bring up that excuse. I want you to share some of these with those around you. And they bring up that excuse. Oh, I don't need to be at church to be, to be a Christian. I want you to listen to these benefits. One of them is wise counsel. Wise counsel. Proverbs 15.22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Where's a Christian going to be finding wise counsel? From one of their secular co-workers? From one, a family member who's not abiding in God's word, praying or worshiping him? Multitude of counselors. Knowledge of God's Word, another benefit. When we're gathered in a small group in Sunday school, we're hearing the Word of God together. When you're gathered in worship, you're hearing from the Word of God. Rekindled worship. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We can sing to God on our own. We need to sing when we're by ourselves privately, but one another. Spiritual refreshment. My brother Carl and I were talking just a moment ago. Man, one of the blessings of us coming together and gathering is for this spiritual refreshment. God's word, we're gathering to worship him. Comfort and encouragement with one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And, of course, there's powerful prayer. When we gather in prayer, this corporate prayer time that I've dedicated and devoted, I want that to be a time that we as a church take time to pray together. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, 
I am there in the midst of them. Folks, it's important for us to get away. I know for all of us, we take time to get away. In summertime, it covers the beach, and there's the lake, and you got the fall, you got the Carolina games, the Clemson games, and those themselves are not bad or wrong. But don't neglect to gather with your church body. I'm going to give you a challenge and encouragement as your pastor. I want you to think about your calendar every year. And I want you at the end of this year to, you can make, think about it, make a note. All the Sundays that you were with your church body gathering, how many Sundays you were apart. And I pray the Lord will speak to you. When we're gathered together, that's when we hear things. I've had a church member say to me, a preacher, I had someone not long ago uh, you know, I know we're partnering with this church in Boston, but, man, do we know that they're a, a, a solid church? I'm assuming they are. And I said, I've shared it for many, many Sundays from the pulpit. When you come only once every, two, every month and a half, you're going to miss that. It's important to get away. I'm not going to come down on you, but it's important that we gather as the church. We gather to celebrate his faithfulness. We gather to celebrate the Lord. Don't neglect the gathering together. Third and finally, I want you to see in God's word, celebrating his faithfulness revives and strengthens us. Celebrating his faithfulness revives and strengthens us. It revives and, and strengthens us. Notice verse 17. I want, to, I want you to see this. End of verse 17. The sons of Israel had not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. In other words, there had not been such passion. There had not been such seriousness since the days of Joshua celebrating this feast. But look what it says at the very end of verse 17. And there was great rejoicing. Great rejoicing. Verse 18. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day and they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. Folks, the combination of the joyful fellowship, the feasting, the hearing of the God's word, that strengthened the hearts of God's people. It encouraged them, it, it brought this rejoicing, this, this passionate celebration. Just as Carl said a moment ago, Aubrey said this before too. It's easy to go through life and we get worn down. There are times where it feels like God's not there, but it's those times we must look back and remember his faithfulness. And we start thinking about his faithfulness. It stirs our hearts. It lifts our spirits. It reminds us, man, God's been faithful in the past to me. He's faithful today. He'll be faithful tomorrow. You know, we all have stories of God's faithfulness. Every one of us here, I've shared many. I've shared this before, so please bear with me if you feel I'm repeating myself. But this is, a, when I think about God's faithfulness, this is a story that always comes to mind for me. When Dorothy and I found out when we had Aubrey, she was about eight months old this time. We had two cars. I had a 2000 Honda Accord. Some of y'all might remember it. I had it until about 2017. And then she had a... a Ford Taurus. Now these cars were just big enough to carry one car seat for one child, but there was not much more room for anything bigger than that. Well, eight months after we had Aubrey, we found out we were going to have another child. Another baby was on the way. He's actually back, back, back there on the back pew back there. I had no idea how we were going to be able to buy a car that fit both of our, our, our baby's car seats in it. We were living in a parsonage, living by the beach. It was expensive. We, just, we couldn't afford another new car. I had no idea how we were going to be able to make that happen. About a month, month and a half after we found out Trevor was on the way, Dorothy's mom called her and said, you know, we're thinking about selling our, our two SUVs. These, these vehicles were about three years old. They weren't that old. We want to know if you all would like to buy them from us. Not only did they give us a great deal on these two vehicles, we traded in her Taurus. They gave us a, a little extra discount of trade-in value. And then they ended up taking that Taurus and they donated it to an inner-city ministry 
in Huntsville, Alabama. God's faithful. God's faithful. And so many of y'all can tell even more stories than that. And we also know that God's faithful even through the trials and even through the tragedies. And some of you here this morning have walked through some tragedies that many of us couldn't deal or handle, but you, God brought you through because he's faithful. One of the most powerful statements my pastor ever said, I remember, never, I remember one time, the end of the sermon, I don't remember anything else about the sermon, but I remember my pastor saying, I've not always been faithful to God, but he's always been faithful to me. My first reaction was, man, my pastor's not been faithful to God. I can't believe he said that. I'm going to tell you off flat out as your pastor, I've not always been faithful to God, but he's always been faithful to me. And he's always been faithful to you. When we celebrate God's faithfulness, when we're weary in our walk, when we're concerned about what tomorrow might bring, celebrating God's faithfulness gives us that renewed spark, lifting us up, giving us that faith and that fresh touch from God to move forward no matter what the future might hold. As we get ready for invitation time, there's a, an anthem, kind of become a, a new anthem for our young generation. Some of y'all know this song. If you know it, you can sing along with me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. So you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Can you remember his faithfulness to you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're weary in your spiritual journey. Maybe you've forgotten God's faithfulness thus far. Maybe you need to trust Jesus as Savior. See, God sent Jesus to suffer, die, and rise again for the forgiveness of our sins. We have a bright hope for tomorrow because of what Christ has done in our lives. If you've never trusted Jesus, God has shown himself faithful more than any other way by sending his son Jesus. While you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. Maybe this morning you need to come to this altar during our invitation time and lay yourself before the Lord. Maybe you need the time just to rejoice and celebrate his faithfulness at this altar. Maybe he showed himself a, in a faithful way in your life that you just need to say, you know, Lord, I've never taken the time to really just praise you and celebrate your faithfulness. Or maybe you're a little worry, weary and worried about tomorrow or about maybe something today. You just need to come and spend a moment with God meditating on his faithfulness to you. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He invites us to feast on Jesus, the bread of life, to drink Christ, our living water. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Don't forget where you're headed in the faith. Persevere in the truth. There's strength, there's revival in taking moments to stop, to remember, and to celebrate God's faithfulness so far. Father, we thank you for reminding us of your faithfulness. We thank you for the reminder of taking time to celebrate your faithfulness in our lives. Father, as we get ready for the time of response, I pray that, Lord, you would move hearts to come to you, remembering your faithfulness. There are those who need to come to trust Jesus, Lord and Savior, because you've shown your faithfulness by sending Christ to suffer and die and rise again for the forgiveness of our sins. There's others of us that need to come and just offer ourselves before you as a rededication, renewal, that we're going to step into the future trusting you with no matter what's before us. Father, there's others of us that need to come and take a next step of obedience, maybe in 
for believers' baptism, maybe to come and unite with this church body and membership, maybe to come and surrender and say, Lord, I'm surrendering to your call. I'm surrendering all to you. Father, we're using this time now to come to you to surrender because you are so faithful. Show up and show off as you draw people unto yourself, and may you get the glory through it all. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Would you please stand as we have a time of response. Would you come as God will lead you to this morning? Hymn number 275. To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely. to depart, I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. As I've said before, the invitation time doesn't end as we walk out. He's still working and moving, so would you be sensitive to what he's speaking to you about and those around you? As our brother Aubrey closes us out with a word of prayer as we dismiss this morning. Heavenly Father, as we stand in this place, we've just sung a song, I Surrender All. Father, for those that have asked you to their hearts we made that prayer many years ago some a few years some a little bit further back but father are we still surrendering all today is our life an example of your love are we serving you with the mind of christ as we spoke of in sunday school today is our mind set upon the things of the lord or is our mind set upon the things of this world father teach us to surrender all i surrender all we surrender to you father bless us this afternoon be with us till we meet again. 
In Jesus' name, amen.